button. Here we go. So we begin our Purim with an accent. The idea uh, gave me, um, the idea came from uh, Rabbi Kogan, who organized the Hanukkah with an accent, which was a terrific program. And we decided to take it on the road. So again, one more time, the three rabbis, Rabbi um, Manus Kogan, Rabbi Louis Katan, and Rabbi Michael Farbman, and myself, Rabbi Ina Servo Litvak of Temple Shalom in Sakasana, New Jersey. So um, let's see. Um, I would ask uh, Michael Farman to go first and uh, share with us his a uh, uh, little bit of his biography and anything else that uh, uh, Rabbi Farman you want to share. Well, first of all, uh, I want to say thank you to everyone for being here, and of course to Ina for uh, for welcoming and inviting inviting us. This uh, this is exciting to be together with colleagues and. Uh, and to to try and figure out everybody's accent, we we all have accents, right? First of all, first and foremost, Purim is the time to wear masks. And while usually we wear masks that, and I see some masks cover wonderfully your eyes, this year at Temple Emmanuel, we've decided that that's the mask that is the most fitting uh, that we could all wear uh, for Purim. Uh, in fact, we sent in our Mishloach Manot, we sent the actual face masks that that cover our mouth and not uh, and not our uh, our faces. But um, I'm going to use the the fact that I can have this kind of a headgear and pretend to be a rabbit. Uh, so it's Rabbi T, I guess, for for tonight. Um, I thank you for for inviting me. I grew up in in a place called Vitebsk in Belarus. Um, and as uh, as Ina and has correctly pointed out, I do speak Russian. Um, I went to rabbinical school in, in England, in London, and I've served communities in England, uh, in Russia, in St. Petersburg, in Ina's place of birth, uh, as well as in Washington, D.C., and I have been in Connecticut for almost 12 years now, uh, in and Orange, just outside New Haven. So I'm excited to see some of our members here as well. As well. I think that's, uh, that's probably it as far as introduction goes, right? Um, do you want to tell us about your family, your kids, maybe? Uh uh, I don't know. Okay. Sure. <laughs> uh, I have two sons. Um, they are is now a, a sophomore at Tufts University in Boston. And Robert is a junior in high school here um, uh, in our local school. So yeah, we have uh, grown up kids, I guess. Uh, and Rabbi Farman, you have mentioned to me recently that uh, you were uh, going for more um, um, uh, studying, right? Uh, so do, can you tell us a little about well, that? Well, just like my friend Rabbi Sarah Litvak, we are gluttons for punishment when it comes to more and more degrees. And so a few years ago, I went back to school and completed another master's at Yale Divinity School, uh, trying to check and see if the gray matter in my head was still functioning. Apparently, it is partially. So I'm excited about that. And um, how, how did you find it um, difficult or um, easier to study while you uh, now working full time? I, I think that, well, you know, it's for him, so it's appropriate to make inappropriate jokes. Um, uh, when I when I realized just how intense all of this was going to be, the first high holiday matched up with the start of a new semester kind of put me through a ringer. So I started saying things like, well, I figured I will either have an early heart attack uh, and drop dead, or I'll figure out how to keep all of this going. Either way, I will not be quite as upset about it. So it, it was tough. Uh, it was tough. Let's just say the first year after it was over, just going through high holidays alone felt like a breeze. So uh... <laughs> that certainly tells it all. And uh, of course, in the style of a uh, uh, Russian Jew, a uh, dark humor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's hear from uh, from Rabbi Katan. Hi, everyone. My name is Luis Katan, as you can read there. And uh, originally from Montevideo, Uruguay. Um, I've been a, a cantor for over 30 years and a rabbi for oh, a little bit uh, close to a year. Uh, also when, went late back uh, to school and um, and uh, just uh, finished uh, my studies in, um, in last April. And I'm here in Westport, Connecticut. Um, 
Well, what were the other questions? Where I am? Oh, okay. What what else do I do? Um, um, uh, I'm I'm really involved with the Cantor's Assembly. Um, Didn't you become the head? I'm sorry. What? Didn't you become the uh, uh, president of the Cantor's Assembly? The, I will be uh, becoming the president in in June, the, the, this coming June. Wow. Yes. Inshallah. <laughs> and um and um what else uh also grown up kids and a 10 year old um uh, how many have, children do you have I have four children two wow. boys and two girls Perfect. um yes and um and also yeah um what else happy to be here this is uh really an interesting uh, experience thank you for inviting me uh, you're very welcome. You recently uh, uh, went back to uh, the country of your birth, right? Um, for I just visit. visited. I just visited yeah. Uruguay. Yes. Yes. Um, how's the? Um, how's the? Um, can I ask the Magali Janulis if you can mute yourself so that we can have spotlight on our speaker? Oh, I'm here. Yeah. Could you mute yourself, please? Can you put on mute? Not Ina, Ina, you can mute her. You can mute her. Uh, hold on, let me see. Um, all right. Oh. Oh. Luis, uh, uh, just keep speaking and then it will be a spot. All right. So uh, oh, yes, I just visited, I visited, I visited uh, Uruguay. I spent uh, three weeks in Uruguay. And uh, one week was, um, one week was the, uh, um, Quarantine, which is uh, uh, mandatory. You arrive and they they uh, check you. You have a uh, they check your your um, your fever, and temperature, and uh, mandatory quarantine. And then after a week, you uh, order a test. They come to where you are, and um, and in I mean, if you have the test done in the morning by by the by night you have the results and you're free to go after that mm -hmm. and um and summer in uruguay is quite interesting and that's one of the reasons if we are starting kind of a segue for the next question but i'm not going to say anything more than this this one of the reasons that purim is not so much of a thing in the jewish community in uruguay is like imagine purim in july or in august what would be Purim in July and August for us, right? And I leave it here. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, it certainly excludes some of the customs, but uh, yet uh, at the same time, you can do all the, um, um, you know, the beach customs kind of like, you know, but we'll talk more about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. No and now uh, we uh, want to welcome uh, Rabbi Manas Kogan. So the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Rabbi Cerebro Litvak, and it's good seeing Rabbi Katan, whom we have known for, uh, I think, the seminary, maybe 25 years ago. This I can tell you exactly the year. Do you want to know? Sure, go ahead. You have it there? 1987. Wow. <laughs> we, organized, we organized like a conference for, for a, a friend of, of mine, of blessed memory, and I, and yeah. you attended the, that that conference, and it's good yeah. seeing you, Rabbi Fardman, and being with everybody here. Uh, I just want to say something that that it should be obvious by by, by now. But um, we we talk about many people say when when we are going back to the normal, when we are going back to the normal. We everybody wants to go back to the normal, and I want to say that this idea of this program is only can happen because we are in a COVID time, because we could not have figured it out if we didn't have to. And now I don't think that we want to go back to, for, for example, to, to not having this. This is, I think, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunities that are open for all of us uh, once we discover how we can work virtually together and share programs and, and friendship and, and many, many more things. So just something for you to think about. So I was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, lived there, studied psychology there, then uh, studied the Seminario Rabinico, which is a conservative seminary in Buenos Aires, and went to Israel, got the master's 
at Hebrew University, went back, two years in a congregation in Buenos Aires, two years in the, in the Dominican Republic as a rabbi. I was this, the, the chief rabbi of the Dominican Republic. And the oh, wow, one, I didn't even know that. No, the, no. The, the no part, that part of your biography, that is very yeah, cool. Yeah, the only, the only one, the only one of, of the five families I was there. And, uh, <laughs> and then I was eight years in Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, my two youngest children were born there in Roanoke, Virginia. And I have been at Hilker's Jewish Center for 15 years. Uh, and so that's a, that's a little about, about me and my background. Thank you. And uh, um, I want to share how um, and uh, my connection with uh, uh, all three and when we've met. So um, uh, I met uh, Rabbi Kogan and Rabbi Katan uh, through APAC. Um, which uh, we attend uh, uh, pretty regularly and um, um, we support all three of us. And uh, Rabbi Farman, I've met back in 2005 when I, um, I went to Moscow for the World Union for Progressive Judaism. Uh, um, uh, it was a huge uh, um, convention there and uh, um, then um, I went to St. Petersburg when uh, Rabbi Farman uh, was serving the congregation there. And uh, actually, I was also at your installation. Installation, that's correct. That's correct. Installation. And actually, Rabbi Server, if I may, if I may ask, um, since we have congregants from all the different places, I know that you guys are hosting this, uh, but I think we need an, an introduction from you as well. You need to tell us, uh, those who are from outside of your community, <laughs> Uh, a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, thank you so much for this invitation. Um, I um, um, I was born, at, not sure how I'm going to make a spotlight on myself here. Uh, okay. That's okay. The people can, can do it. Yeah. If you um, give me, if you, if you make me a host, I can do it. And how do I do that? I forgot. <laughs> forgot about it. Forget about it. Anyway, you can see me anyway. Um, yes, yeah, so I was born in St. Petersburg. And uh, um, uh, you know, I had pretty uh, a pretty good childhood. I can't, uh, to be honest, I can't say that uh, um, I was witnessing a lot of anti-Semitism personally. But uh, um, I remember from uh, um, a teacher taking attendance, uh, and she had a journal, and uh, as she would go through all the names of the children in the classroom, uh, there was a nationality next to each name. Now, the Jew in former Soviet Union was a nationality. It wasn't the faith, right? So um, even though we were, of course, Russian, because we were born in Russia, we in Belarus and uh, um, Ukraine, but nevertheless, um, it would say uh, uh, Jewish. And uh, uh, later on in life, even if uh, through the school, the teachers weren't uh, discriminating against you in terms of you know lowering your grades, but then later, if you would want to go to um, a study in a, a school, a university, um, then it, you would have a hard time if in your passport uh, you would have this fifth line, which would say that you are a Jew. Um, well, when I was 18, uh, my family and I uh, made Aliyah to Israel uh, in uh, 1990. And um, um, that was a time when plane after plane after plane would bring uh, Soviet Jews uh, to the uh, back then old airport. And uh, we came just before Rosh Hashanah. Uh, so we were all receiving apples and honey. Um, I uh, studied music in the uh, Music Academy in Tel Aviv, and uh, um, upon uh, finishing the Academy, uh, I heard about uh, uh, the possibility of uh, becoming a cantor, of, and uh, that was uh, actually, you know, suited me much more than just being a singer, because uh, I always loved uh, uh, to hear the uh, uh, cantorial music. And uh, um, so I um, uh, came and uh, finished, uh, came to the United States, uh, finished the Jewish Theological Seminary uh, as a cantor, and then uh, worked in reform synagogues all my life. Uh, met my husband uh, at Simchat Torah, uh, Nei Jeshur, um, just uh, before I finished the school, and uh, we um, we got married right uh, before, actually right after I started my new congregation in Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, and then uh, quite a few years later, 
uh, I felt uh, uh, a need to go back to school, but also um, I realized that um, uh, my passion is also to become a rabbi. And so um, that's another connection between uh, Rabbi Katan and myself. We went to the same school, uh, Academy for Jewish Religion. Uh, and uh, so I was ordained as a rabbi there. I have two girls, 17 and 14, I live in New Jersey. So there you go. And now the questions about Purim, enough about ourselves, right guys? What do you say? All right, so the first question, um, how do you celebrate Purim in your country of birth? And we'll go in the same order. So we'll start with Rabbi Farman. Oh, so I get to be the first, huh? Um, well, uh, the the answer is uh, growing up in, uh, in a smaller town in the Soviet Union, uh, there was no such thing as celebrating Purim in my childhood. Um, and I was, I consider myself very lucky that when I was 15, uh, that things began to open up. Soviet Union was beginning to slowly implode. And as it was imploding, the, the general freedoms and freedom for Jewish expression uh, arrived. And uh, I actually happened to, to, to have been in the right place at the right time for the first Purim to be celebrated in Vitebsk uh, in, uh, under, uh, under the new reality. So in 1990, um, I found myself in the little apartment uh, with, with a group of teens and one of the refuseniks who had a copy of a Purim spiel written um, all, all in poetry um, that was one of the, those illegal things that was handwritten on a piece of paper. And they handed it to us. There was one person who was leaving the country at the time. Um, and a bunch of us came together and rehearsed it. And then a, a, um, a concert hall was rented in the center of town. And it had 150 seats. And there was no advertising because it wasn't safe. And it was a word of mouth. And they were selling tickets. And somehow all of this was going to happen. We had no idea uh, where we were going to get the money if the tickets didn't sell. Uh, there was 250 people that showed up. The people were standing in the aisles. Um, there were people out there crying in the audience because they were saying, I've only once seen this as a child. It was in 1939. This was the first time, uh, certainly in the post-war uh, Vitebsk, that something like this could happen. And as a 15-year-old, you know, uh, in my mom's robe with a, with a towel on my head, playing the role of a Hashverosh, uh, that was a pretty impactful thing. So um, I, I've, I've loved Purim ever since and, uh, and continue to love it and struggle with it, uh, of course, which is quite appropriate. But um, even though it wasn't part of my childhood, it was definitely part of my teenage years and remains ever since. So, yeah, um, I love every costume that I have worn, including the ones that were slightly uncomfortable. And I admire my colleagues who all came so dressed up. I have to say that my digital mask today is the best <laughs> costume I've ever had because it allows me to not be itchy and scratchy underneath. I can just be fun. Thank you, Robert Farman. I love that story about how you um, uh, staged the Purim. I, I may have come across that uh, Purim spiel, I think, in Russian, because it's probably just one and only. And it, it, was, it was pretty cool. Um, yeah. Rabbi Katan. Same, same question goes to you. Now you can tell us how, we how you celebrate when it's nice and hot. All righty. So, <clears throat> Purim sometimes falls uh, in this, I mean, either at the end of the summer or at the beginning of, of the uh, fall. And uh, if it's at the end of the summer and there is no school, when you're a kid, you don't even, a Jewish kid, and it's not a small community. Um, Montevideo has a million and a half inhabitants, the capital city of Uruguay, and Growing up, there were approximately maybe 25,000 Jews. Um, and uh, I would say that if you're a kid and it's summertime, you probably don't know that was, it was pouring. You don't have a clue if it was pouring. Uh, maybe, maybe through, 
through the synagogue, but you need to be in town and, and lifestyle in, in Uruguay is that you're most likely you're not in town. With the another additional difficulty, which is that in February, uh, we have kind of the entire month of Carnival, which is the like uh, Mardi Gras equivalent. So there are shows in in street uh, uh street uh, stages and platforms with uh, uh, portable in, uh, enclosures that local uh, used to be amateur, but now it's kind of professional uh, troops uh, do parodies or whatever, which is pretty much the spirit of Purim, but is kind of the spirit of the entire, the entire country that during the month of February, you have parades and you have shows outdoors and uh, and people throw uh, water at each other, and, and 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 so that's kind of the environment. So get sometimes poor him get for a kid gets confused with carnival, with carnival, with a Mardi Gras. Um, if it's at the beginning of March, which is the beginning of school year, if you are in a Jewish day school, then there is something some reference to to um to purim uh probably there will be a custom parade growing up we did something that is really unpolite for nowadays choosing uh choosing malkat estel it's like a beauty pageant uh, contest and uh, and uh i remember those days when we re we, re we 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 had the, the queen esther of of, of the year in, in school and there is another uh, another environment in which Purim was celebrated growing up, which is the environment of the youth movements, what we call the Tunot Noir. Uruguay, as well as Argentina, Brazil, Chile, other other countries had, and in Europe, también, uh, también, in London, uh, also. <laughs> um, we have. Um, we have what is called the the Tunot Noir, the 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 um, the youth movement uh, organizations. They were linked to uh, Israeli youth movements or political parties. So then you have a Noar Atzioni that is linked to the liberal Zionist movement. You have a Bonindor that is used to be uh, connected with uh, with the the uh, Maharaj or or what it, what it was. So that part. Um, there was uh, the the uh, the uh, Betar, which is connected with the with the uh, Likud party in Israel, and those to not know are used to get together at least once a week, and during Purim time, uh, more than just I mean, other than reading the Megillah, was more like festive, again parades parties dancing pretty much also the way that it's done in israel is there are more like parties and dancing and drinking than the actual megillah reading that has a, a more uh, i would say ritual slash religious slash community oriented or synagogue oriented uh celebration then growing up i i started attending the 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 synagogue and I was part of the choir, and then I was uh, it was a, a cantor in training, and the celebration was pretty much a small celebration with almost with no costumes at all, maybe some hats or maybe maybe a mask, this type of mask, not the the COVID masks, um, and uh, and the Megillah was read in a kind of. Um, uh, in Spanish, actually, so people could understand and relate to the Megillah. And uh, in a kind of theatrical, dramatic way. And I would say that we had, I don't know, uh, I mean, again, it was summertime. It is uh, in, in a 1,000 family congregation back then, before leaving, maybe, and I, I left uh, from Uruguay in 2003, Maybe we had I don't know 30, 40 people, and uh, and that was all, and and mostly uh, retired or adults and and almost no kids. So the the 
the way we lived in Uruguay and the, the cultural impact that the youth movement and, and, the, and the Jewish day schools and, 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 and the role that they play, it's bigger than this, the role of the synagogue, at least for the, for the celebration of Purim. Well, thank you so much for the story. I think that uh, my flapper costume will be perfect for this summertime. What do you think? Yes, absolutely. Right, that, would, <laughs> that would work. Thanks so much. And last but not least, Rabbi Kogan. Thank you. My costume will be great for the, polit the corruption, polit the corrupted politics in uh, uh, politicians in Argentina, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I want to say, uh, would like to save you some time and just tell you that uh, Argentina, Argentina is very similar to Uruguay. I don't want to say that because I don't want Rabbi Catan to be offended, but Uruguay is to be a province of Argentina. But, <laughs> I, but I don't want to say that here, you know. Um, no offense taken. No. <laughs> I, I feel like this is the throwdown that switches into Spanish very quickly. Right? Yeah, yeah. So. So it is, it is very similar, and especially Buenos Aires, where I grew up, is very similar to Montevideo. Uh, for those who don't know, all the accents of Spanish accents are different, but Uruguay and, bueno, and Argentina have the same Spanish accent. We are the only two countries who, I think, share the same Spanish accent. Um, I want to add a little more about this idea of the summer, because I think Rabbi Catan, summer here is different than summer in, in Argentina. In Argentina, the month of January and February, everything stops. Here in July and August, you still have activities, you still have shul, you still have sometimes bene mitzvahs. In Argentina, January and February basically stops. And so the, the shul takes vacations. Many shuls, they really, they close for January or February or the rabbis leave and they leave a rabbinical student. Uh, people go on vacation for an entire month to the beach. Uh, some Argentinians go to Uruguay. There is a wonderful beach resort there, very famous. Um, but if not, they go to Argentina or they travel. But the, the, the pace of the country really slows so much. There is no, there is no school, no, no day schools, no regular schools. It's like a spirit of a party, like Rabbi Katan described it. Uh, so it's very little possibilities to experience Jewish holidays during the summer. The same applies to Hanukkah, which is in December. Everybody already is going to the beach and, <coughs> and in Purim. <coughs> I also want to say, and I don't know if I can speak for you, Rabbi Katan, but I, I will guess speaking for you, that we didn't grow up, Rabbi Katan and I, in observant families. So we grew up in maybe traditional families, families who were not observant. So, you know, we went to day schools, we learned Hebrew, which was very common for Jewish families there, but we didn't, maybe we, went, we celebrate Pesach and went for Rosh Hashanah and Kippur to the, call it, to the synagogue, but we didn't celebrate Shavuot, Sukkot. Uh, if you live in Uruguay or in Argentina and you are Orthodox, then you will celebrate the same way Orthodox families will celebrate here. But the, I didn't grow up with, with the experience of Purim that we have here in Argentina. The only thing I remember is omentation. I think my Bobe, may she rest in peace, used to make them. Uh, my mother remembered that we ate them for Purim. And uh, maybe Grogers from the school, whenever the school was open at that time. And, and the story of Mordecai and Esther from, from school also I learned. But it uh, was a wonderful, wonderful upgrade to move to the United States of America even in Roanoke, Virginia, and have the experience of Purim the way we have it here. Thank you so much. And um, I want to add, because I got to celebrate Purim uh, in Israel. That was my really first experience of Purim. Uh, just like uh, Rabbi Farman said, that there was not much uh, the celebration of any holiday really back in uh, um, in Russia, former Soviet Union. But uh, uh, my first uh, Purim in Israel was especially remarkable because when uh, my family made Aliyah in 1990 in September, just a couple of months later, uh, if you remember, uh, the uh, Gulf War um, 
uh, started and um, uh, we were uh, walking around with gas masks and hiding in the uh, Hedera tomb in the um, special sealed room um, during the war because when we heard uh, the sirens, we uh, would not really know whether it was a chemical attack or regular, uh, although um, human beings uh, tend to adapt and get used to everything. So we were getting used to carrying a gas mask with us at all times. But uh, again, if you may recall, the war uh, ended just before Purim. And so the celebration of Purim that year was especially elaborate and remarkable. And everyone, uh, you know, went into the streets of Dizengolf. I was uh, um, in Tel Aviv at the time and anywhere in every single town and city in Israel, people were celebrating not only Purim, but, uh, you know, defeat of uh, Haman and defeat of uh, Saddam Hussein. Some were wearing his mask. So that was amazing. Um, and uh, um, I just spoke to a friend of mine who is volunteering in uh, Mishtara in the police in Israel. And he told me that tomorrow they will be uh, making a way to the vehicles with uh, uh, like a parade also uh, in, uh, in the local town of Kfar Saba, uh, even though people are still kind of in the lockdown, but um, uh, there will be vehicles with uh, uh, colorful, I don't know, uh, 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 pictures uh, to celebrate. So, all right, and moving on to the next question, because we don't have that much time left, unfortunately. Um, do you feel uh, you can relate to the Purim story, uh, considering you know which country you're from? So back to Rabbi Farman. Well, I think that uh, you know, being a congregational rabbi, um, Purim is uh, for 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 reasons that continue to remain unbeknown to me. I sort of understand, and and thank you, Rabbi Katan, for and 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 Rabbi Kogan for sharing the the challenges. It's nice to know that Purim can be challenging for for calendarical uh, reasons uh, as well, but of course. Uh, in the United States, it is hard to uh, to compete with with things like Halloween, right? So, uh, very often, uh, I, I'm every year I see families who wouldn't imagine or uh, or dream of not dressing up and not celebrating Halloween because it's such a, a lot of fun for kids. And yet on Purim, it doesn't necessarily transpire, uh, translate into the same uh, level of excitement about costumes. And, and I could never quite understand why, uh, why it works the way it works. My kids tell me that uh, it is because, of course, it's very easy to get caught up in something that, that happens around you, right? Which is essentially the same as when there are carnivals on the streets outside, how do you differentiate that from, from Purim? And it works uh, in, in the other way um, with uh, when, when everybody around you celebrates something and dresses up and there are carnivals and other things, it's easy to get caught up in that. But when it's something that makes you stand out, that means that it takes an extra effort. Having said that, there is an incredible message of community and community building and organizing that is embedded right within the Purim story. And I think it continues to be, uh, not only was it historically the story of survival of Jews in diaspora, which I think to all of us diaspora Jews, it speaks uh, very powerfully because unlike other stories in Tanakh, stories of adversity, where Jews struggled uh, in the in the famous description of any Jewish festival, they tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. Um, the many of the other things, including uh, Hanukkah, of course, are about survival in the land of Israel, being independent in our own land and our own country. Purim gives us the message of hope for diaspora survival, uh, but it also gives us a recipe: uh, being organized, being community-minded, uh, knowing who we are, and deriving strength from that. So it continues to bring very powerful and positive messages, with some challenging parts, as they say. You know, as long as we don't talk about what happens at the end of the book, uh, we're <laughs> we're okay. Thank you. And um, now back to Rabbi Katan. Thank you. So um, do I relate to the story of Purim? Um, first and foremost, 
full full disclosure i don't like wearing costumes i don't like painting my my face i don't like wearing masks i mean i feel uncomfortable <laughs> um so and the the way we celebrate sometimes um <clears throat> sometimes it's kind of a not not totally aligned with this with what i believe this is kind of the spirit of the of the of the celebration of, of, of the occasion. First and foremost, what we what we are uh, as um, uh, as we 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 mentioned before, uh, one of the things that we are we are celebrating is is the survival of a of a nation within another nation, and um, with that has a, a lot of similarities with our story, our history uh, as, as a nation as a people uh, through the through the years um, having others in this case a king uh, controlling the destiny of of the Jewish people or the Jewish community at least in, in Shushan and um, and that's that's kind of uh, troublesome because um, uh, we are still living in diaspora. We are here in America and doesn't stop being a diaspora. Sometimes it feels it like it's not. Uh, I remember moving in 2003, our first destination was Miami. And I was coming from a country where anti-Semitism was something to be aware of, not to be afraid, but to be aware of. So after school, you walk home and you maybe wear a hat or remove your key, but not just to stand out in the street. And uh, and see if someone will approach you, you you're kind of, not defensive, but kind of aware. Your senses are a little bit more alert. And uh, one of my first nights in Miami, walking the mile that was from my shul to the house, it was Miami Beach. For those who know, Miami Beach is Lincoln Road, I'm sorry, um, Michigan Avenue and Alton Road, uh, one block away from, from Lincoln Road. Um, Show me your hand if you if you identify that. Very good. I know. I know. So, um, and I'm stopped at the at, at the traffic lights over there, and I cross the street, cross Alton Road, walking up. I mean, towards Miami City. I mean, on the on the Venetian Causeway, in a black, dark, uh, windows Honda Civic, turns around, slows down, next to me and lowers the window. And I was bracing for something. I don't know what's going to happen. And half of the body of the person, of the, of the, of the passenger uh, side, goes out of the window and he, and he yells, good Shabbos! And uh, that I realized that there is a different uh, feeling in being Jewish, in, of course, in Miami. <laughs> And then be, being Jewish in, in, in South America and Uruguay particularly. Uh, we are in the New York area. It, it's not so much different. But yet, lately, we have been realizing that we are still considered, at least the way I perceive it and the way I feel it, we are still considered a foreign object in, the, in, the, in, in society somehow. Um, and, uh, and that's troublesome. And that's why one of the things that I relate, really relate to that, the fact that there is some sense of um, statement of what is has been historically uh, the relationship between the Jewish communities and the local governments or communities. The second thing, which is very uplifting, is that through uh, political and diplomatic efforts, the community of Shushan could could have be, could be I mean was successfully saved and. Uh, and that's something that also speaks volumes about, well, what do we need to do? Well, we need to do is uh, build bridges and, 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 and speak up and uh, uh, establish relationships, right? All Jewish communities needs to, need to have that relationship. And that's one of the things that, uh, yeah. Wonderful. I, I love that story about uh, the, this guy in Miami <laughs> from, the, uh, from the car. Okay, and the Rabbi Kogan. Thank you, Rabbi Sever Litvak. I'd like just to say one thing about what Rabbi, Rabbi Katan said, and, and 
especially for those who are, who are born in this country, sometimes with all the challenges that we feel that we have, and right now we may have some challenges and regardless of your political affiliation, some people complain about what happened in this country. The level of freedom that, that we experience in America is, is incredible in comparison with what happened in other countries, even today uh, with all the challenges that, that, that we see. And I know that I'm not, I'm not praising what's happening, but, but when people say to me after you know, the riots, you know, oh, you're accustomed because this is happening in Argentina also. So I just tell them that you cannot compare or in Uruguay, you know, you can, you, whatever, whatever you feel that is, that, that you are lacking here, uh, what Rabbi Katan was, was talking, that people will, will just walk in the street and will say with Chavez, I was in Roanoke, Virginia for eight years. There are not many Jews there. And I was eight years and I never experienced one episode of anti-Semitism in, in eight years. And I, and I had my kippah every single place I went to Blacksburg, to Virginia Tech, to, to places that you may not know that exist on the map and never, never had, uh, which is just unthinkable in a place like, like Buenos Aires. I, I just wear my kippah and I just look around to see what's going to hit me. You know? So that's, I just want to share this feeling because it's, a, it's apropos of the story of Purim as well. I want to say that for me, the story of Purim uh, has a message and it has a message that, that when we are at, at the mercy of, of, of another sovereign, or you know, when we are not an independent state, when we don't have what we call today Israel or a Jewish state, even though we have a feeling of, um, of, of security, of safety, it can change overnight. And, uh, and I think this is a message of, of Purim. And Esther went to, to, the, to Mordechai, went to Esther and asked Esther to come in front of the king. Esther was trying to convince Mordechai why it's not convenient at this point. And Mordechai told Esther, do not think that you are going to save yourself from among all the Jews. Do not think that you will be spared. When they are going to come for us, they are going to come for you too. And our experience showed that when they want to come for us, money didn't help us, connections didn't help us, the king didn't help us. That's what happened to, to medieval to medieval Jews that they, they went and they closed themselves when the pogroms came in the, in the castle of the king and the king many times handled them to the, to, to the mob. So I think that we need to work on building bridges. We need to work on, on being strong. Uh, and we need to also to, to keep supporting the state of Israel, which is a place where we are going to feel safe as Jews without relying on, on who the, the, the government uh, will be at that particular at that particular moment. So this, this, is, one is, of, this, one of, this is one of the lessons I learned from me. This is such a great message. And uh, actually it's something that uh, I've uh, discussed today with the uh, um, uh, director of our local day school. Um, you know, I, I kind of complained that uh, the, the things are a little changing for Israel um, nowadays. And uh, he said, well, it's up to uh, Netanyahu. Uh, he, uh, he has to do certain things. And uh, it reminded us that, uh, you know, as much as uh, we can uh, uh, rely on the help of uh, others, but at the same time, we have to stick together. That is important to continue to celebrate those holidays and be together. So speaking of, I'm going to jump to my last question because uh, some of you have to leave. But um, uh, while I'm asking and the uh, participants are giving uh, their uh, comments, uh, I want everyone to please uh, place your questions in the chat box um, so that uh, we'll leave uh, a couple of minutes for our dear rabbis to answer your questions. So last question is, um, do you think that Purim is still relevant to celebrate all these years later and why? And some of you uh, sort of answered it, but if you can uh, uh, reiterate uh, again, so Rabbi Farman. 
I think every festival is worth celebrating, uh, and and I think Purim uh, continues to be a, a really powerful story. I, you know, whether whether we should, okay, we we've started by acknowledging where we grew up. Uh, growing up in Russia, you know, the the part of Purim which says ad loyada, uh, where you have to drink until you can't tell the difference between. Uh, blessed be Mordecai and cursed be Haman. Uh, you know that that part, I guess, was was quite natural. So, bravo, bravo, Michael Harmon. Uh, well, that's, you know that's <laughs> a, that's an important <laughs> that's an important part. Um, but I but I think um, you know in in general, Purim is a super important uh, festival. And in fact, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, we approach Purim and we say, as long as we ignore the end of the book. I think, Dafka, we have to read the entire book, uh, the entire Megillah. We have to read the entire book of Esther. We have to read the uncomfortable part. We we have to we have to read the the difficult questions. We can we can study them. We can laugh about them. If you've never seen the Hudim Bayim, the Jews are coming. Uh, the little Purim skit uh, about. Hey, let me Esther. interrupt you because we had our Torah study group today, and I showed them this segment. Yes. <laughs> It is it is incredibly irreverent and super funny. Uh, it raises some interesting questions, and you know the the beauty pa pa pageant, which wasn't really so much of a pageant, uh, and of course the parts uh, at the end, which come with, at what 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 is the price that we pay uh, for for survival? Um, what what is uh, the responsibility? What is the danger of too little power? What's the danger of too much power? Um, and and so I think Purim itself, it's great to have an excuse to dress up and to party and to have a drink if you if you if you do drink, um, but you don't have to. You can celebrate even without that. It is wonderful, and of course we should. But it also continues to challenge us to consider who we are. And unlike some of the other festivals that kind of give us this consideration for a personal journey, you know, around high holidays when we talk about introspection and really considering ourselves, Purim really raises some very tough communal questions, political questions. How do we engage and interact with society at large? And um, Purim is the time where there are no answers, uh, but there are lots and lots of questions. And so for those people who say, oh, you know, Purim is a festival for little kids because it's all about dressing up. I think that's a cop out answer. I think that's too easy and we should continue to engage with Purim, both with fun uh, and with some grown up stuff because it's uh, it's all there and very powerful messages for all of us. Yeah, and speaking of grown up stuff, you know how they sugarcoat the uh, Hamantash and uh, here for the kids in uh, America saying that it's the hat of him. But uh, if you know Yiddish, Hamantash literally means Ozne Oman, which means uh, Haman's ears, which were cut after he was hung. So. Uh. <laughs> Haman Tashin means uh, pockets with poppy seeds. Uh, tashin, yeah, Tashin the pockets. Yeah. But so, but in but in Hebrew, you're right. But in Hebrew, in Hebrew it's it Oznei Oman, right? But, but I mean, the, the the real name is Oznei Oman. Too. I was always confused. Why would you stuff um, um, poppy seed into somebody's ears? But you know. <laughs> All right, I'm going to jump to um, actually Rabbi Kogan because he has a minion to go to. So I'll uh, let him speak before Rabbi Katan. Yeah. Thank you so much again for inviting me and I, I will need to leave in eight minutes. Oh, look, Julia, you're great right there. Um, I, for, I, I, will, I will bring another message for, from Purim. Um, and Mordechai tells Esther, she doesn't want to, to go. And Mordechai tells her, maybe this is the reason why you, you were there. Maybe this is the reason why you became a queen. Uh, you were wondering why, why me? Why do I need to do it? And Mordechai is saying, because this may be the mission for, for which you were put in the position that you are. And I believe that all of us are put uh, in life for, for a particular mission, for a particular thing that we need to, to do, that we need to repair. The word tikkun comes in place. Each of us has our own tikkun, our own, our own thing that we need to make a difference. And maybe it takes the entire life to find out. 
but I think for me, this is the, this is the story of Purim, is to say, this is what Esther did. This is what Mordechai did. What are you, man, is going to, to do? Where is going to be your, your difference? So that's what I wanted to, to share. I will be a little longer here, but I wanted to thank Rabbi Cerebro Litvak for, for putting this together and Rabbi Katan and Rabbi Farman for, for sharing the space and everybody who's joining us, the big Sharkoah and hopefully we'll do more programs like this. We have an entire calendar of Jewish holidays, Rabbi, so we can we can do more more things, more things with accent. Well, yeah, like a silent retreat with an accent, for instance. Yeah. <laughs> well, Rabbi Gogan, you started the trend, so kudos to you. All right, Rabbi Katan, here we go. Um, all right, thank you, Manis, and uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Um, and thank you, Rabbi Sreber Litvak, for, for putting this together. Um, I would say that there are a few things that are two things, and in, in, a, very short, in a, a very short time, I would like to share. One is the word put in means to throw lots, right? And how chance sometimes gets in the way and how things that are not, that we are not able to control, right? And what are the things that we are able to control, right? And Purim gives us a lesson of those two things. What are the things that we cannot control that are totally thrown to, to chance? And what are the things that we can do and we can control? And being in this pandemic, it's a, also a great opportunity to ask ourselves, okay, what are the things that we can control? What are the things that we cannot control? And the other thing is how different the world looks from the other side, right? When you are being, when you're listening and watching the, 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 the hollows to be uh, built, to, to, to be being hanged, and then everything reverses and, 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 and we have a, a, a twist of, uh, of fortune or divine intervention, the way you want to uh, 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 look at it. And um, it's a message of not ever, ever, ever uh, losing hope, always thinking that things can turn the right way uh, even right before the end. Thank you so much. So uh, there is one question uh, that I saw in the chat on, on the question. It's from Barbara. What is the video you mentioned? Are you by him? You mentioned it. Oh, oh, oh that was, uh, it was Michael. Okay. The, it was um, Rabbi Farman and myself. Yes. So uh, in English, it's the Jews are coming. If you search in Google, the Jews are coming and then the different segments, you can search it under the Jews are coming um, Esther and uh, you will find it. It is historical and it's also translated um with with the subtitles so you can entire, understand the entire series is fantastic i like to say yes entire it's every single episode and when, whenever i need some uh, good laugh i would go and jews are the jews are coming um any other questions oh there you go uh rabbi farman shared the link with you thank you any other questions we have like a couple of minutes for questions um well if uh, no one has questions, actually, uh, Rabbi and Cantor Katan, I was going to suggest that we'll uh, sing Ani Purim, and uh, the way we will do it is uh, I'll sing one phrase and you'll sing another phrase. How about that? Can okay, good. Yeah, Can sure. Try? All right, so you, you start because you have a lower voice. Ani Purim, Ani Purim. Purim. So Same. Okay. Okay. La 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 I think that's an awesome way to finish this program. Again, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, the peak of the uh, of our session was uh, like fifty one people. So uh, awesome job. Hakurim uh, Sameach. Stay healthy. And Bekarov uh, Bayamenu. Soon we will all meet in person. In person. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming, and, and thank you for Rabbi Sirbro Litvak for hosting us, uh, and uh, for all of you to showing up. All right. Thank you so much. Blessings to everybody, and Hak Purim Sameach.